2019 school board workshop and as per our standard uh, procedures I will turn over to Madam Vice Chairman. Thank you Mr. Seeger. The first thing is the policies and if we could have uh, Mr. Greiner come on up. I mean Brian. 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 Sorry. <laughs> That could be interesting if Greg's going to go through the policies with us. That would be quick. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we have some policies left over. I want to say somewhere between 12 and 15 maybe. Uh, some of them are duplicative. The first one is an inaugural policy for you, and it's the IROC, and it's back for more fun today. And I believe that your board attorney has weighed in, and you should have a red line copy, or at least an edited copy. Yeah. 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 <coughs> From him. Disciplinary suspension of IROC. IROC. Oversight. Oversight. We've been through this one time together, and I believe that the edits are probably where we might want to focus and see if you're in agreement with those edits in red and see if you agree with Mr. McKinley's additions to the report you saw last time. I don't know that I have. Do you guys have a red line? I don't no. Know. I'm, I'm, looking at I'm looking at both of them, but I do, I mean, I kind of just from having... So I can highlight those for you yeah. if you'd like. Because yeah. on the yeah. administrative, it's all showing black to me. Okay. But I think I know but I know what the changes more. are, but maybe. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to share? I'm okay, because I might have highlighted. Do you want to switch? Do you want to see hers? Do you want to share? Mm, that's okay, because so I know which one. Sorry. To the, to the, to the side. So on the, on the second page, uh, where you have the list of representatives, um, you go down to Punta Gorda, Port Charlotte, North Association of Realtors, and there's an addition there that says, and the Englewood Area Board of Realtors share representation annually. No, I don't have that on Because that got added, and, and I, the only thing I, and I did want to make sure that everybody knew. Um, this one's not red line either. Because in discussing with um, Mr. Seeger, um, there's been times when we've talked about having Ebor on it, and then there's been times when they left off. I'm totally fine with having them on there. My only question is, does the Punta Gorda, Port Charlotte, Northport Association of Realtors, do they know that it's going to be rotated? Like, was that made clear in the letter that was sent to them? Again, I think it was clear at the meeting we held when, when we spoke to the, that night. I think, it, at least at orally, it was presented that it was going okay. to be. Okay. And then they were there, and, and rep, their representative was there, if I'm not mistaken. Right, so she understands that yeah. next year it'll be the e mm -hmm. Okay. The next edit that I see from Mr. McKinley is the citizen at large, and he put the uh, numeric one in front of that, one citizen at large, shared representation annually among five voting school board members, <coughs> resident district, residents districts, representative to be selected by a seated board member in the year of that district's turn, beginning with district blank and proceeding in numerical order after that. So he's got a more formulaic approach to who's, who's in and how it rotates. So I think the blank there is which district or which region of the district you want to have represented first. Which region? We already have one. District 1. Oh, it is District 1. It is District yeah, 1. Yeah, we, yeah. we've talked about that. That, appoint, or that appointment's already been made. <laughs> and then the next edit is in term of membership all IROC members, he changed committee to IROC members, and then he jumps down to... Well, can we, let's go to the top. Okay. I have an issue with saying they have to be registered voters in Charlotte County. Number one, I don't know that we can police, you know, are we going to request voter registration cards at every meeting? And number two, whether you're a voter in Charlotte County, if you're a resident of Charlotte County, that's you know, I would say a they, need, they need to be full. They need to be full-time residents of Charlotte County, but to require them to be voters, I don't know how we're going to. Mm -hmm. Number one, how we're going to police it. I don't think it's necessary for someone to have membership. I agree. 
Can we put the same language that we have for the hearing officer? That was one of the things that came up with the hearing officer for textbook um, adoptions. Like we had some kind of a thing about them being residents and how we were going to know if they were a resident. Didn't have to do with having a driver's we license or something. That. Yeah, I'm that's a good idea. Too. Ballot Florida driver's license or ID card. I think that's what it said for the hearing Passport, officer, right? Blockbuster card. If you have a blockbuster card, you are dying. You are definitely a member of Charlotte. You're definitely a <laughs> resident of Charlotte County, by the way. Chuck, we'll make sure we get you that for you. Yeah, I, the, the, uh, yes, I put same language as hearing officer policy, okay, yeah. so I, I've made a note of a comment so we can definitely make sure that they sing with the same language, I think. So in that term of membership, he added after the Fifth line, the initial appointee shall take office effective February 11, 2019, <coughs> and their initial term shall run until November 17, 2020. Thereafter, 2019. Well, actually, um, one of the things that came up at that meeting that the members were unhappy about is that they would just be getting their feet like stable and just wading into it and then they would be off that was banned that was definitely talked about i thought the last meeting we talked about having it moved to february so it was like a full year. well but when we had the meeting that night they voiced as a group a desire <clears throat> to continue until to 2020 yeah so that they like any other new position they want to learn my problem with the, the overall paragraph is how do we have control over each of these agencies that these people are even going to be on these agencies every year, every... That's... <clears throat> do we need to build in language that deals with replacements if those... Or do we just simply grant that authority to the agency that they're rolling off of? I thought we did decide that we were granting them that I authority. Did, well, well, I, I, we don't appoint somebody from the organization. I, do. I understand that, but the the point is, when it comes off, it doesn't. We don't have any language as to so, so the procedure. In, so, in theory, the EDP member gets selected by EDP, and in November, and EDP has their board member elections in. January or whatever, and that person is no longer a member of the EDP board. The question is, is the onus on the EDP to put a new person in that place, or is the onus on us to say, you're no longer a member of the EDP board, so you don't get on it? I'm of the opinion that we leave that to the organization. Um, but I agree, but I think we should we should change the language of saying, rather than members, um, we might change the organizational representative. That way, the, the organization still has its place at the table and can make the appointment but by saying members were oh, were implying that that individual it is that okay. where I, I would think the that makes sense. Mm. I get it. it's typical lawyer talk just, so the organization then would bear the responsibility for filling any vacancy yes. by virtue of their internal right. correct structure okay I mean that's fine if you want to change it I, th I think it's I think that's necessary because the paragraph up here says that the 11 members comma each appointed by one of the following organizations mm -hmm. that right. pretty much lays it at their feet in that right. if it if you're going to be more comfortable with I, say organizational representatives that's good well we're going to get into much more detail here in a minute okay so do we really want this first group to serve Basically, two years. Because that's what we're year, saying. Year and a half, and I like I like it that's being concurrent with years. our organizational meetings. So when, whenever we have our committee assignment meeting, and we then do the all board that stuff that we can review there. Board member number <laughs> district number two board member okay. to say right who their this person is my is. person. Okay. Okay. Did you want to hear more in that paragraph under term of membership, or do you feel comfortable? Thereafter, the term of each IROC member shall run from the date of the school district organizational meeting pursuant to Florida statutes held in November of each year until the next ensuing November organizational meeting. You're good with that? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> 
And then he continues to substitute for the word committee, IROC. He, he's consistent with the acronym yeah. throughout. I think that's fine, isn't it? To keep saying IROC. It's also the International Race, Race of Champions. champions. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, I wanted an IROC. Yes. And then his next edit is under meetings. And there, the second sentence says, this initial meeting shall occur, or the, the initial meeting uh, occurred. Occurred. He put past tense February 11, 2019. I I don't know that that is what this should be. Um, I think the language should be the district's chief financial officer shall coordinate the initial organizational meeting of the IROC and then put a a time frame on that because this is this is a policy about going forward, not what we already have, in my opinion. So it. it this says, the way this is written, the chief financial officer is having the only meeting he needs to have, um, which I don't think is true. I think every year, that new IROC, because there's going to be rotating members, every year there needs to be an initial meeting for that term. So the old language of the initial meeting shall occur before July 1st, 2019. So we just go back to the initial meeting shall occur before July 1st of that no, year? No, because it can't. Before, before July 1st. So April 1st? I, I would say the district's chief financial officer shall coordinate the initial organization meeting of the of the IROC. The initial meeting shall occur no later than February 1st. 1st or make it February 11th so that this year we weren't out of compliance with our policy. Thank you. That's no, no, no later than February 11th annually or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that way it says that the, the committee gets appointed at the organizational meeting, and now no. we have three months to notice them get for, to get them all lined up, and for Greg to sit, well, for whoever the CFO is to sit down and say, "Okay, group, you're the IROC. Here's what here's what you're going to be asked to look at whenever we start having conversations about referendum dollars." Do you uh, is your preference for where one? Do you want to say on or before February? Uh, I think you should no, say no March one than, so that we're not in. Mm -hmm. No later than February 11th. No later than February 11th. Just as a, well, it's arbitrary. But that's you need to say February 12th. <laughs> it wasn't later than February 11th. It was exactly on, on or before February, February 11th. No later than February 15th, and then and then we put some you know. It's the middle of the month kind of thing. We're about to lose the superintendent with this. Watch <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Greider back there. I hope somebody checks her calendar and makes sure that was the right day. Yeah. Okay. Under officers, on or after the school board organizational meeting in November of each calendar year, the IROC shall annually elect a chairperson and vice chairperson from among... Its membership at the initial he just, meeting. He just says from among its membership. At the at the initial meeting, because the paragraph above says they're going to elect a chairperson and vice chairperson at that meeting. Take away <laughs> on or after, just say at. <coughs> Sorry. Put at before the school school board organizational meeting. Thank you. Which well, yeah, are you yeah, they're, that? they're not going to elect the chairman at the organizational meeting. Yeah. Uh -uh. I would say after the school board organizational meeting in November okay. of each calendar. Take away year, on and or make capital A after. Chances are they're going to do that February 11th or thereabouts oh. meeting in most okay. cases. But, but it's important to say okay. after its membership at the initial meeting. Because that's the paragraph above talking about meeting says that that's when they're going to elect the chairman and vice chairman. Did they elect the chairman and vice chairman February 11th? Yes, okay. they did. I knew they did. I just didn't know if it happened at that first meeting. That's what would happen. I want to make sure I'm clear on this. I now have, after the school board's school board organizational meeting in November of each calendar year, the IROC shall annually elect a chairperson, vice chairperson from among its membership. Is that what it now says? At the initial meeting. So. At the initial IROC meeting. You see what I'm saying, Chuck? Go ahead. Yes. The paragraph, I mean, we could take it out of the paragraph above and have it be whatever Oh, we I want. see. It's in both places. Right. I see what you're saying. Right. It's in two places. One says we're going to do it at the initial meeting, and the other says we're going to do it on or after the org meeting. So it just needs to be consistent. Do you want to strike the one under officers and just leave it sit under meetings? 
or do you want to import that second paragraph under meetings and bring it down under officers? Well, see, at the initial organization, the problem is we're using organizational meeting for IROC and organizational meeting for school board. And those are two different organizational meetings. But we have at the IROC's initial membership meeting. But if you okay, go up to meetings and it says the district CFO shall coordinate the initial organizational meeting of the IROC. At the organizational meeting, the IROC shall elect a chairperson and vice chairperson. Then, the, under officers, owner after the school board organizational meeting. So you, you're, I'm just, I, we know what that means, but it's, I don't know that. I, I think what would help there maybe is the word "its" instead of "the" after "at." At its organizational meeting, the IROC shall select. A yes. Chair. There you go. I T S. And then Where are you putting that? Under right, meetings or under officers? Un under meetings, the second paragraph, it says, add the, I change the to its. Do we even need that paragraph that says officers? Well, the only thing, yeah, because, I mean, under officers, <coughs> it would just say, the IROC shall annually elect a chairperson and vice chairperson from among its membership at that point, because we've already talked about when they're going to so, I mean, we kind of already said that, though, at the organizational meeting, the IROC. No. Did I miss something? I think this is the condition of when this occurs. That this one under officers now has a condition, and I think a different wording here would say, the IROC shall annually elect a chairperson or vice a vice chairperson from among its members, following the organizational meeting of the school board in November. No, not needed. Because they're not going to. They're going to select. They're going to select their chairman and vice chairman. At their first board. Oh, so you don't need to have the reference right. to the board. There's meeting. no, I don't think that we need to talk. It doesn't, the, the school board org meeting doesn't matter at all in this. I'm with Kim. I don't know why we have an officer's heading whenever under meetings it says they're going to elect a, a chair and vice chair. We can so take I, that I would out. strike we'll the return. entire officer's thing and that solves the whole thing. I like that. That was the that was the last edit Mr. McKinley had from your first reading. That was the last. And how come they get a dignified meeting space? <laughs> I was just going to say, going back to the the Charlotte County Chambers of Commerce. Yes. The shared represent, representation annually with one of the following regions. Shouldn't that be Chambers? And then right. like Ponte Gorda Chamber, Charlotte County Chamber, Inglewood Chamber. Yeah, you're right. Instead of Port, Just Ponte right. Gorda, Port Charlotte, and Inglewood, because you could have somebody from Charlotte County who lives in... Exactly. Right. Who lives... I mean, Charlotte County Chamber encompasses the entire county. Right. So I would say from one of the following... And instead of it saying Ponte Charlotte Board. County Chambers of Commerce, it should just say Chambers of Commerce, because yes. mm -hmm. that's right. confusing. So yeah. it should say Chambers of Commerce, shared representation annually with... One of the following the Punta Gorda Chamber of Commerce, the Charlotte County Chamber of Commerce, the Inglewood Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, so right. just, just delete regions and add Chamber of Commerce after each of the three. Well, except it, it's not Port Charlotte, it's Charlotte. It's Charlotte County well, Chamber. Charlotte County Chamber of Commerce. There is no Port Charlotte Chamber. I'm a little confused. Okay. Are we keeping Charlotte County at the front Could of... Take out Charlotte County. Take that out. Right. So it's just, it's just say Chambers, Chambers of, of Commerce. Commerce. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then shared representation annually with the, with the following. I would just say with the following, because yeah. it's not really done by region. With the following. Punta Gorda Chamber of Commerce, Charlotte County Chamber of Commerce, in and Inglewood Chamber of Commerce. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Are we done with that one? I just have one more question. Under the open government laws, what's the subcommittee? This provision shall not apply to any by workshop of the school board or to any subcommittee meeting. What's that? Where is that? Oh, it's under, under the open government Okay, laws. I see it. Yeah, I'm looking at it. I shall provide a It's the second paragraph under open government laws. Where are they? The second sentence. Oh, yes. Yeah. Joint workshop with the school board or to any subcommittee. I guess if IROC decides to appoint some kind of subcommittee or to look into so this, is, this is purely about the public being able right. to address. So okay. if IROC comes to the school board to give us a presentation 
they do not have to allow the public the opportunity. If they come to a school board workshop, they don't have to allow the opportunity, the public opportunity to address them. If the IROC, although I don't even know that IROC could have a subcommittee because it's, I guess if they would have to notice it like any other meeting because it's sunshine, but if, assuming that there was the, the IROC SVU and those five people had a subcommittee that would have to be a publicly noticed meeting, but the public would not have the ability to address. Right, I think our attorney is just trying to cover a what if. Yeah. Okay. Is yeah. all that is for. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next one we have is 1140.01. And there are three in sequence that all carry roughly the same intent. And it has to do with discipline, and it has to do specifically with the duration. <coughs> duration of any discipline that would accrue without pay in the form of a suspension and all of the edits have moved us from 5 to 15 and the only frame of reference I have for that is that on Steve's watch and my watch we have never exceeded 15 but we have gone to 15 as a fairly significant message to someone who otherwise might have been terminated so I don't know how you feel about that move but Gives broader discretion to the superintendent. Is that some? Is that a bargained question? It hasn't been. It no. doesn't have to do with. It's not no. a. Um, there is suspension without pay, there as an option, but it has never dictated the max. Okay. This was brought forward by Neola, and when we saw the five, we felt like that was fairly limiting. Okay. Uh, do we have a definition of misconduct in the office? I mean, it pretty much speaks for itself, but there's not one in ours. Is there a statutory definition that people can look at? There's one you're going to see later today. Okay. All right. And it has subsets of behaviors that lead to misconduct. That's all. I'm, I just want them to be able to look yes, at what. exactly right. That's one. Makes me think of the scarlet letter. Right. Immorality, moral <laughs> turpitude. They're all. Yeah. Do they have to wear that letter? I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know so what Nathaniel would say about that. So the 1140, 3140, and 4140, that's the only edit in all of those, right? Correct. Okay. And, and I, I do think it's worth visiting the 3140, which is the instructional staff one, because it does actually answer Mr. Seeker's question about what constitutes just cause, and these would be the infractions that would fall under misconduct that we would look very seriously at. And they include immorality, misconduct in office, incompetency, gross insubordination, willful neglect of duty, and being convicted or found guilty of or entering a plea of guilty to, regardless of adjudication of guilt, any crime involving moral turpitude. This, uh, just so you know, this this set of new policies come from, uh, or comes from, the new statute that was put into force on July 1 of 2018, and it's 1012.795796, and it it is the heavy hand of the state reaching into our district and saying, you will investigate, you will report, you will report within 30 days, and at the cost of the superintendent losing his salary for a year. That's pretty much what the... Yeah. But it it's, uh, it's really has us dancing. It's, it's a very compelling law. We now have um, professional practices sponsoring a site where we have to upload all documents. We have sent, even in one case, 1,600 documents. Most of those are uploaded by PDF format. It's fairly labor-intensive to convert all of our print material from Word into PDFs. Um, there's a lot of hustle going on around this law and there's another one coming soon in here I just want to alert you and that is that any behavior that we find that may have impacted kids who sat before that teacher those parents must now be alerted and that is a frightening prospect also because let's say the behavior reaches back five years we would be scrambling to find every child that sat before that teacher over a five-year period oh my lord on the so other hand, though, this is to be, protect it is. children. This it is, is to protect children, to make sure that somebody yeah. who's, who has had that misconduct isn't leaving and going to another school, <clears throat> including a private school or a charter school, that that record would be available for people to see. So. In my career, this has become more exacting over time. It used to be very easy to say, oh, you're going to Florida, let me write you a letter. 
regardless of what happened in Michigan, New Jersey, you know, California, you could send them on and say good luck and hope you reverse your pattern of behavior. That's all off the books now. And now you see how dialed in this is. I, I think the, the question for us, and we were having this discussion this morning, is you won't always know whether a child was impacted by the behavior that sent the employee to termination, but they they may rise from being notified. Oh yeah, that happened to me, but nobody ever contacted me. You know, so it, it it's just rife with some complexity. I think. Anyway, that was editorial comment. So that is a, a greater amplification of thirty one forty, and now we're rolling into technology, which is why uh, Mr. Bress is here. Uh, this one is 5136.01. Uh, these are probably among the more complex policies you're going to see, uh, and it does give you a glimpse into Chris's world because of the complexity and the amount of uh, scrutiny we have to give to the use of technology. So with that, uh, I will say this first one uh, has to do with um, student use, allowed and prohibited devices and the use of those devices coming from their homes to school, including the bus. So you'll see actual references to use of personal devices on the bus. Perhaps, Chris, you want to... Yes, um, so as you go through the policy, it kind of breaks it down into the different times of when students can use equipment and when students can't use equipment. And there's special language in there to make sure that students are not using equipment to humiliate or bully other children. And so there's some specific references to that. Um, the decision of the closest person in charge is usually who gets to decide if a device can be used. For instance, on a bus, a bus driver could say yes or no. At school, it would be the principal and, and such. There's also some language at the end that I think is important because it formalizes the process of what happens to devices if they're confiscated. So there'll have to be some instruction done with our building principles so that everybody's aware that that's um, spelled out in policy and is followed appropriately. And if there's any questions on this policy, I'm happy to address them. I, I think, too, on, on the, the back side of the second page here, there are those things that are big red flags for us, and they're, they're outlined in two fairly large paragraphs, and one of them uh, enumerates the kinds of material that should not be transmitted. Uh, so that's number one, which includes threatening, obscene, disruptive, and sexually explicit. And then in number two, there's no allowance for sending, sharing, or viewing, or possessing pictures, text messages, emails, or other materials of a sexual nature including sexting. And then in the next paragraph, uh, there's this idea of uh, devices that capture, record, or transmit words or images. Um, so there's, there's a lot in this that we really have to scrutinize every day, every minute. Yeah. And it's, it's a daunting task. Yeah, well, and I think that the big part about this is everybody is so used to everybody having a phone that people don't think about how easy it is to violate somebody's rights with that phone. Mm -hmm. You know, especially, and some of, some of which the, viol the violations could be inconsequential all the way up to severe. You know, for instance, um, we have to have signed permission if we're going to include a student's picture somewhere. However, if you're having a band concert and a parent takes a picture, they post it directly to Facebook. Yeah. You know, so, so there, there's a lot of a lot of context in here that we need to make sure that we're handling everything as appropriately as possible. I'm going to need a full-time compliance officer just for Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of what we're going to see in here kind of falls into that category, like how, are, how can you ever possibly police some of this? But that, but that can't stop us from Trump. trying. We would, we would be remiss right. not, to, not to foster as much effort as possible. Right. It's also fair to say that uh, Chris's department and HR overlap quite a bit in the course of a year in terms of what we're obligated to do in protection of students and what he has in terms of records that may or may not amplify that harm to students. Mm -hmm. so.
we are we are right. in each other's business. Sometimes the the bigger problem can be in releasing information later than from the initial yes, absolutely. effort. So that's always a, a juggling act. What, what was the logic of having this be its own policy? When we have I don't know how many policies that are in this world. Is it do you want it, it? Was the idea let's have it in its own standalone place so that we can point directly to this rather than having to dig through the social media policy. It was a recommendation of Neola pretty okay. much kind of for that. Okay. Reason. And I think this, the intent of this is to separate it from staff use. This is all yeah. specific to students. Yeah. And you'll see later in here there's staff mentioned. Have you done a crosswalk to make sure this isn't in conflict with the other policy safety policies that we've talked about in this realm? Yes. And, you know, and I think that, you know, I think we're safe in that issue. Okay. But the bigger part will be instructing people about it. Because even though some of this may seem like it should be common sense, people often will not follow some of the things being stated in here because they've just become so comfortable using those pieces of technology. And a lot of this will unfortunately fall to the teachers and to the principals to make sure that they're policing the students in these areas. You know, with everything from vape pens that look like USB drives and, and things like that. A lot of this equipment can be relatively surreptitiously used, so people have to pay attention. And Dr. Dust Darden's. Dr. D. So this, all these paragraphs here about student use of technology, is that reflected in our code of conduct? I believe it is. It's pretty tight, yes it is. Yeah. So then we just have to make sure that when the kids are having their orientations, that it's reviewed. Although I can say from experience yesterday, that I was at a middle school and talking to the girls about some of these things. And I know that our SROs have been in there and talked to the kids about what to do with bullying, what to do with school safety, see something, say something. I'd say about half the girls denied that they'd heard anything about it. Because they're middle school, they don't, you know, yeah. retain always. So, there's repeating. Okay. So the next policy is 7530. This one is about... Um, board-owned technology and where it might travel and what the conditions of that travel and use are, both on school grounds and off school grounds. That's the overarching. Right. And a couple of, uh, a lot of the language is similar in nature, but slightly reworded. A section that I bring to your attention in the middle talks about individuals authorized to use board-owned equipment off district property are prohibited from allowing anyone else to use the equipment, such as spouses, children, relatives, etc., which is approved by use by, for a specific person. And in my area, we kind of teasingly call this the cereal and milk clause because we <laughs> often find things that get turned in broken is because their kids were using a device while they were eating breakfast. Mm. Or having coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if that, would, yeah. If that would be an authorized <laughs> yeah. employee to get that, not a... <laughs> the only other part that I think is also important is towards the bottom of the first page. It talks about um, storage of records. Okay, um, If people are using external drives, such as external hard drives, thumb drives, and this will require some instruction as well, um, the drives either need to be encrypted or password protected in such a way that if the drive is lost, somebody leaves it at Starbucks or something like that. Because by nature of a computer, you have to log into the computer to get miscellaneous equipment. But if a hard drive's not encrypted, they can simply plug it into another. Right. So that will require some instruction of staff. And there's also in that same paragraph the reference to personally identifiable information, which amplifies what Chris said. If, if you can learn about a child and somebody has captured that on a file, that's not good. The next one is uh, on 7540 again, red line. The next, oh, we'll have three versions of that. We did, we did 7530, so we didn't do Oh, 7540.0. Yeah, just straight. Just straight. There are two of those. Um, this particular one is the unsupervised use of technology resources, limited or denied is not under the direct supervision of school staff and it charges our superintendent uh, to require um, implementation of 
the guidelines, Comprehensive Technology Plan, CTP, and maybe you want to talk about the committee and the plans. Sure. Um, we've been doing most of what's in here under just kind of different titles. We've had a district technology advisory council for the past four years where every school is invited to send a member and every department is invited to send a member. And we try to meet three to four times per year. And anytime there's going to be a major decision made in technology, we kind of talk about it in there. From everything to which model Chromebook do we use to what order should we implement wireless in. Um, because I often say in a group like that, none of us is as smart as all of us. I can't think of everything that's important to an elementary school is going to be different to a secondary school. So that advisory council's been very powerful for us and you know has helped quite a bit. The second part in here is where they're talking about a comprehensive technology plan. To date, we've been write, writing digital classroom plans, which is basically kind of the same thing. But as you've probably heard, the last couple of years, they've not been required and this year we're going to lose approximately 50% of the funding that we got through those, which is the money that we were using to increase our Chromebooks so that we could test an entire grade level simultaneously. So it will not be much to transition that plan to this plan. It does state that, it, um, that we'll bring it in front of you each year now so that you can see it. We have a, a good 95% plan right now, and I was trying to think if I should have brought it here but I thought with all those policies, I would separate it for you. <laughs> so it wasn't so chunky. And then I'm, I'm kind of thinking June because April will be referendum, May will be every student presentation known to man, and then <laughs> June would be a good time for technology. <laughs> but that's basically what this is all about. On the second page, though, in the second paragraph, I think it's important to um, mention some of what's going on here. Um, students are already being educated about online behavior. The school resource officers um, work with the students. We also subscribe to some materials that teachers can use if they would like. Um, but it also talks about the um, use of social media, online, interacting with others in chat rooms, etc. And I wanted to bring to the forefront <coughs> This year we started using a new content filter called Securely. I don't know how much you've heard about that or not, but it's, it's a wonderful content filter because it gives us a much greater insight into those things in particular. And um, if student searches reach a certain threshold of concern, the company will send us emails so that we can address this with, with the students everything from thoughts of suicide to thoughts of violence. And then if it go, goes to another level, then it becomes phone calls. And so we've had many interactions this year where we've been able to, to talk with kids that we might not have known what they were thinking. So Securely has been great. The other advantage to Securely, without getting too geeky, is it's a web-based content filter. So if we send a Chromebook home with the kid, even though it's not here with us, it still has to pass through the filter to do whatever they want to do. So we do not lose, lose visibility to it. Good. The next policy is 7540.02, Web Content, Apps, and Services. Uh, there's a lot of redlining in here, and um, I guess it jumps pretty quickly to creation of content for web pages, sites, and apps. So yes, there's a pretty much complete rewrite of this, and um, it brings it more into modern times and also addresses a lot of the concerns that you might see in the press. You might have Notice recently some other governmental agencies were running into problems with websites not meeting the requirements for handicapped people to be able to access them and such. So starting on the third page where the new language starts, you'll notice up top it talks about how the content and apps that we use must meet the Children and Internet Protection Act as well as 504 Rehabilitation Act and it lists the, the miscellaneous pieces, which is all very good. Um, one of the nice parts is Community Web Manager, which is the web page system that we moved teachers to at the end of last year, has a compliance check built into it. So it, they, they will be able to try to look at it and flag it because a lot of times people, very, very, very rarely are people going, I'm going to violate this on purpose. You know, they just violate it because they don't know better. And, you know, one of the things that often happens is, um, if I was to scan this document and post it to the website, it would not be compliant. 
but if I was to print it from a PDF from Word, it would be compliant because a screen scrubber could read the digitized version but not the scanned one because it is a picture of text versus. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know? And so a lot of times people, they don't think about that type of stuff. So as it goes through there, it talks about that. Then it also gives the rationale of why do we use web pages to educate, inform, and communicate information. Um, the next really important piece of information is in the paragraph underneath number three on that next page. And I'll just highlight that it says, an employee may access third-party sites and services previously approved by his or her principal only through the use of his or her district email address. Where and that, I'm sorry, on the next page, there's, page. A, there's a one, page two, three. Four under number three, the last line of that paragraph. Below number three. <laughs> This last sentence I'm reading. Okay. So the reason why that is important is there are going to come times where different schools may want to use a resource and they could use it in a very good way, whereas other schools may think that resource is the devil. You know, I, I teasingly use cool math games as that. We have some schools that want it worse than life itself and others that have a holy war against it. You know, and it all depends on how they're using that resource and if it's a problem to them. So this opens their ability to access certain websites underneath the principal's approval. However, it must be done with their district email addresses. The reason being, the reason it's important for them not to use private email addresses is let's say that you eventually have a disgruntled um, employee and they're posting using a private email address. They could post something and the district would have no ability to filter it. Whereas if they were using their district we could lock their email address, send to the company, give us a reset our password, we could reset the password, and then, so that will become very significant. So I'll ring that bell pretty hard with our principals that they say that several times a year with their um, faculty, because any site being used at school should be done through a yourshardschools.net um, email address with no exception. See if there's anything else that really jumps out. Oh, yes, there's some significant parts on page six. Um, there's some discussion that teachers, if they're, when they link to outside resources, there'll be some responsibility on their part to make sure that the resources that they're linking to are compliant and viewable by um, students that have handicaps because it would only be fair that all resources being assigned or provided by a teacher are accessible to all children. And, um, and then also at the very end, um, when we're starting to talk about comments, I'll, I'll use the example of Class Dojo. It's a, it's a website that a lot of people use. There's interaction inside that where a teacher may communicate with a parent and vice versa. It will become the responsibility of the person using that system to archive those comments because those will often be public record you know and that will be new for a lot of people so we'll provide some instruction that says if you are using a non-district sponsored website that we purchase that we can do the archiving for you the archiving will fall to your responsibility so like live school, we as a district allow that use of that one. But class dojo, we don't right it's now. It's not so much that we don't allow it; we just don't pay for it. Okay. So we don't because we the, can't right. It. So there's often a change. Like I'll use Remind as an example. We were using Remind last year very well as a free service, but we had no ability to archive it because it was individual person to the Remind Corporation. Once we purchase the license, now all of the messages that are sent through have become archived so that we can search them for public record requests. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I'm sure you've heard Chuck lament on this, five years ago, if you got 40 public records requests a year, that was a lot. Now sometimes you get that a month a or more. A you know, yeah, it, It's crazy what has happened to public records requests. So there will actually be a little bit of discouragement on my part saying to these people, if you're going to use these sites, Please, you know, the, the, this is going to fall on you. You have to be able to produce that because the worst thing that can happen is they don't archive something, but the parent did. Mm -hmm. right. And then the parent provides the record and we can't. If I was a teacher, I'd be very nervous reading this. I mean, it's a lot of responsibility being put on teachers just to, not to delay our meeting anymore, but just to give an example. Uh, my daughter is in AP Capstone and they do a research project. 
her group's research project is on um, psychedelic drugs, LSD and psilocybin, I think it's called mushrooms, and the effect that has on um, mental illness, you know, using those things for to treat mental illness. And so her teacher had to get permission from the principal, I think because of the securely, so that they wouldn't have like a big alert that these students are researching LSD and mushrooms. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's a lot of, in some ways it's, it's, it's a shame, right? Because you want, it's a wonderful thing, the internet, when you can do all this research and learn about these things and it's all right at your fingertips. But then when you look at all these requirements we have here, I mean, to make sure that the site is perfect compliant, I would have no idea how to do that. Yeah, it, it's, I agree with you 100%. It would, you know, it would definitely affect the way that I, I taught, you know, because unfortunately, and you've probably heard it and it sounds cliche, security is not convenient and convenient is not secure you know and it's a horrible state but the other option would be to forbid the use of it right so by trying to allow as much access as you can responsibly but this is more like as a teacher if you're assigning something you say i need you to go to this website and use this website for your information it's when i'm making that part of the assignment that i have to comply with this if kids are just doing research on their own this doesn't have to comply is that correct but if they're doing the research like for in a project, class on yeah. a chromebook yeah. for Class but so then I have to verify class. that every site they're going to is compliant. If you're if you're going to make well, well, so it's kind of halfway in between. If you as a teacher are assigning a specific website, you need to check for those compliance right. and things like that. However, if you give a site, if you give an assignment that's going to cause them to do searches that will probably set off flags okay. all the time, it would be beho you know beholden yeah. of the teacher to say something ahead of time. Otherwise, the principal's going to get a lot of calls. Oh my God! You know what happened? You know, all your kids are going out for psychedelics. Right? Is it a really bad day? You know, coyote problem in Charlotte County now. Because you know we get information without context. The latest vape craze. Um, so I have one question. When I was reading through this, at the top of page four, it says, "Under no circumstances is district created content, content apps and services to be used for commercial purposes." advertising, political lobbying, or to provide financial gains. I understand everything except the advertising because it seems to me that I have a memory that in the past, did we ever do anything with Walmart where like school sites yeah. have like a link to Walmart for we got school supplies? My way of reading this needs to be incorrect. It's us creating something to advertise, not advertising to that us. we're allowing, do if we that really makes know? sense. Okay. But I could be wrong but I took that as pr things that we created. Right. But if we create the Meadow Park website... Well, it's no different than if you drive past a school and you see signs, signs. on their fences. Yeah. Yeah. It's all over the place. So yeah. I think a, a perfect, like something to bring up, because it was the editorial today, um, the One Take video, which was fantastic, right? And it's on YouTube. And my understanding, the limited knowledge I have of this, is that you can set it so that people could, um, that you could get like advertising every time somebody right. watches that YouTube video, right? You could get advertising money. Mm -hmm. um, and are we putting a safeguard in place then that whoever has put that one take video up on YouTube cannot change the settings so that somebody's getting advertising revenue from that YouTube? And do we really not want to get advertising right. revenue? Maybe we would like, because some of those YouTube videos, I mean, if that thing hits a million, we could, mm -hmm. Charlotte High could make some significant money. That's, that's a good question. I do not believe that there is anything against the monetization of videos like that, because that would not really be us actually putting forth the advertisement. Um, but that would be something for you guys to decide if we want to put that in language that it is forbidden. <laughs> now, the only problem often will be is there is a good chance that that video has been posted by many people, not mm -hmm. just the right. school. Mm -hmm. Right. And do we sign? Or do we have royalty waivers from all the students that appeared on the video? Then, well, in a further like, policy, you'll see <laughs> that um, Mike was generous enough to add language to on one of his documents that the parents have to sign every year, where the students have to give us explicit rights with no cost to use any work that they've produced. Mm -hmm. So is that one take video considered district created content? I mean it was done with the principal's permission during class time. I would say so and I would think that it would fall underneath this if we embedded advertisement inside of it. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's just my opinion. 
if, it, but, but if, if somebody, if, if was whoever the gas star we, is a tarp in the side, well, we got it. if whoever has put that up on YouTube, I don't know who did. Yeah, that's right. um, if whoever uploaded it, they could change the setting. To, you know how you go to watch YouTube and like the first right. thirty seconds will be an ad. No, I don't know. They could change the setting for that, and then <laughs> that might not be bad language to include. I don't know something to think about. I don't know. What do you think? I think we can overthink it yeah. to death. I, I, think. I don't think that that's probably necessary at this point. If it became an issue, it could be. But as long as we're not producing the advertisement, okay, is is kind of where I see the line in the sand. Okay. Yeah. By the way, we we just Chris and I just did go through a public information request that asked for two years worth of access through district servers to YouTube. Text messaging and thankfully they ask for text messages and email. Nobody sends texts or emails YouTube. <laughs> but that's a far reaching request where you're looking down every What are they looking for? Like people hole. posting comments to YouTube videos? No. No, they were asking if anybody sent direct messages to it. You know to YouTube. You never know. You never know what the purpose Once is. Again, I wouldn't you even get, know how you to get do the that. question without context <laughs> off the <right. laughs> All right. All right, one side note on this, on page four, about three-fourths of the way down, it says the superintendent may shall. I know you guys have big concerns with may and shall. They're both oh, there, so yeah. I didn't know which one it's that, that was to make both Bob and I. Uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Shall should always be the term if it's totally restricted. May is the term if it has a loophole. So it looks like from here it should say shall. Yeah. Yes. So we're striking may there. Yeah. <laughs> Good catch. Mm -hmm. All right, we're moving on to 7544, and it's the use of social media. Oh, you want to take a quick five-minute break? No, that might be good. I wouldn't mind. Do we five? Two. Maybe. Two. How quick can you go? Two? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Two All right, three. go ahead. Can, yeah. Are we taking, we're taking a break? Okay. The okay. reason really I wanted a break is because um, when I saw our procedure, I, mean, I see it's all brand new and this is their list. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to reset. Reset it? I think yeah. I just did. Yeah, it's good. We're back. All right, resuming the 8141. 80, 7544. 7544. Social media. 7544. One from the bottom. Use of social media. So, this one is perhaps the one that is rife with most potential for misuse. And as you heard Chris talk about securely. Um, it doesn't necessarily answer all of the issues, but the issue of teaching kids appropriate ethical and safe access to and use of the social media is probably the biggest challenge we have, and arguably for our staff too at times. So, yeah. so social media <laughs> is a necessary thing, but it's a very difficult thing to be able to use as a public entity if you are required as that entity to archive everything because the whole method of social media is quick and immediate communication of ideas and things um, between people um, because when you set something up so that it's one-sided that's very much more like a web page okay and so as we were looking at this policy I was actually um, on a committee of eight people that assisted in, in writing some of the Neola language for this because uh, they very much and widely said, you guys are the people who see what people are trying to do and how they're trying to post it and how are you going to deal with it and such. So um, with most Neola policies, I think you guys are familiar, you get a template with a bunch of different choices that you can make because not all school districts will make the same choices throughout. As I was making my recommendations that are in front of you right here, I'm trying to lean as much as possible into using the social media sites since that's where our parents and our kids are, but to do it in a front-facing manner to limit the amount of interaction on that social media site simply because of the complexity of public records. 
you know, and if, if, if we can just go down the rabbit hole for a second, you could imagine that if you have 2,000 employees, arguably 1,100 of them, which are instructional in nature, even if only 10% of them post something, and if every post has 10 comments, and each comment might have one or two replies to that comment, you're generating a massive amount of material. The second problem that you run into when you're in a situation like that is there is no good methodology to search that material. So for instance, somebody might say, I want every comment uh, that was posted to Facebook that said X. Well, because all of this nests down into different areas that may be held by a hundred different separate people archiving that information, the expectation to be able to adequately know that everything was produced to that record request quickly approximates zero. Yeah. So I made most re of the things related to that where um, we're saying that you can use social media, but you need to try to block down comments as best as you possibly can, and anything that is not able to be blocked down must be archived at the schoolhouse level. So starting at the beginning, there's um, Inside, inside the template, they're saying um, the superintendent is charged with designating district-approved social media sites, and there was an option to say, which shall be listed on the district website. I did not put that last paragraph because, as you've seen in many of your policies, some of these things change so quickly that you'd forever be um, chasing that. And if we did not post something to a website that somebody was using, they might come back and say, hey, they're using this and you did not post it. It will not make a difference either way if it's on a list or not. Because any use of social media, you might, might remember, the principals are going to have to re um, give permission to the teachers to use that in a classroom setting. Okay. Um, I also didn't say that um, we are going to have to approve each and every platform because that level of complexity could be very difficult at the district level. We're allowing that to be chosen by, at the principal level. You know, and remember what I said about cool math games before. There may be a, um, there may be a high school specific social media piece that would not be appropriate at an elementary school. Okay? So as we go through that, um, the first big thing I want you to look at is the last paragraph before the next heading where it says social media uh, for instructional school sponsored activities because once again it says um, district social media account sites must contain a statement that specifies its purpose and limits the, those to have access to the social media account to the use of the account site only for that purpose so if they're going to have a website they should put on their Facebook page what is the meaning of this website it is being used to disseminate information to our parents and students so they should put something like that which will require instruction because that's not currently being done in accordance with any specified procedures and applicable terms of service users must use their district assigned email address once again and that is going to be different for some people as well because there could be I don't know how many but I, if, if you asked me to guess I would say more than a couple of websites are being posted using a personal the person's personal email address because they had a Facebook page they created a school page so it's linked to that account rather than to a school account so we'll need to make sure that they migrate that to a school owned account for that very reason that I had told you earlier that if something gets posted to an account that is created with a school district email we have a path to be able to take it down if something is posted using a non school district email we do <coughs> not have a path to take it down does that make sense yep Okay, so then continuing inside um, that, that next paragraph, it does reference a couple of other school um, board policies that have to do with the code of conduct and acceptable use. So that's basically saying that if you're going to use these social media um, sites for use at school, you need to follow all the rules that we have for school. You know, do not post things that are inappropriate. You know, it should be school related. There should not be... Um, pictures from the end of year 
teacher gathering that might have the picture of somebody with a, a drink in their hand, things along those types of lines. So you have to be very careful when you're posting things to social media because everybody has instant visibility into that. And there's, you know, back when we, um, with Seven Habits, there was a section where you're supposed to have a moment between cause and effect. When, when something happens and how you react, you have the choice there. Social media makes that very blurry, you know, because <laughs> people have an idea, they post it, and they might not have thought through all of the consequences of a posting. So people need to be um, aware of that. Not to diminish the use of it, because it is a very powerful tool, but as with any very powerful tool, you, you should be careful when you use it. You, you are careful when you use a chainsaw, okay? You should be careful when you use public media. Um, inside the next section, there's some specific language under expected standards that talk about not including any obscene language, vulgar language, lewd language, things along those lines. It is also important that people avoid at all costs confrontational things, such as some of the things that have been happening recently where there might be a whole side of people that think this way, a whole side of people that think that way. It is not our job as public schools to make a, a ruling on those types of things. You know, So inside social media, it should be for the promotion of the school and the school district, not the promotion of a person's opinion. Okay? Um, underneath the retention of public student records, this is going to be the one that's going to make a lot of the people who are big time Facebook and Twitter users gulp. Because this is that archive piece again. Because archiving it can be very difficult. Because once again, depending on what tool you're using and what level of archiving, um, I could make a post, let's say, and Steve responds to the post, and at that moment I archive it. But then Ian reacts to Steve's post after I had archived it. Now I don't have that, so I'll have to go back and archive it again. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Because any communication that happens in, in this type of fashion, especially because it's viewable to the public, must be archived, especially, again, because people have the ability to delete things. I mean, how many times have you served this, tw this tweet that has been deleted? Well, that's fine for somebody in the public eye, but when you're a governmental agency, you don't really have the right to, you can still delete it, but you have to keep a copy of it and produce it upon request. So with all of our schools that have Facebook pages, let's say, are we giving them tools on how to document all of those? We will be communicating. Okay. We haven't up until this point, but now that this is being written into policy, yeah. and I, I hate to say there's not a lot of good ones, because it's kind of like social media is not designed to be archived, you know? So, so um, a lot of it will require legwork. This to me seems impossible. Just I was thinking the same thing. Because with, for all the things you just said, I mean, is the direction you're going to be giving? Let's let's take you know Murdoch Middle has a Twitter feed that I'm still attached to. Are they going to? Is the direction going to be every day? You need to archive everything that's been on your Twitter feed every hour, every minute, every two seconds. I, I agree. I, it, it's a difficult concept. And, and as you said, you know, the the chances of being able to capture everything are exactly zero. You said they're approaching zero. Yeah. They're exactly zero. <laughs> well, what my recommendation would be, would be if they choose to use Remind instead of Twitter, just like you would tweet, somebody could subscribe. You know how you, you follow hashtag something? Right. You could follow hashtag a Remind feed, and then it's all archived. The only, um, only downside to that is people will say, yes, but people live on Twitter. But it's not difficult to get them to use the other tools. So we are providing a tool that can Remind. solve. What's that? Remind. It's a little difficult to get some people to use. Yes, yeah. well, I agree. I'm not, I'm, I'm not being naive, but we are providing a tool that could do what we need to do. Because theoretically, instead of going into Twitter and following hashtag red car, I just saw red car drive by. I could create a list called Red Car and communicate to my parents, if you'd like to follow this list, text Red Car to 81010. And then you'd get every message related to that in the future. 
The downside is it doesn't have as much of the um, real life ebb and flow as things begin to trend. Right. You know what I'm trying to say? But is it our goal to instruct and educate like in the previous policy? If so, then Remind does exactly what we need it to do. Yeah. If not, then on the Twitter side. However, at the same point, I do believe, and this will ultimately be your choice, I do believe that we can't say no to this because it is where the world is. So we just take our best shot at That's being well, good stewards. And, and if you remember, Chris, seven, eight years ago, we basically were saying no to this. Yes. I mean, I remember sitting at this table and having the conversation of, no, you will not have a school Facebook page. You will not have a classroom Twitter account. Because back then... We've lost the fight by yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, I guess... You know, you talk to your colleagues and you work with other people on this policy, and I notice that when we go to the FSBA meetings, um, we have to be one of the very few, if not the only district, that does not have a district Facebook page or a district Twitter. How are other districts working to stay in compliance with all of this? What well, kind of tools are they using? Well, Steve has you know, communicated that to us, so we are actively starting that. So we have the district um, Facebook and Twitter that's going to be run from communication from Mike to the ICS department, which will be posted just like we're posting things to our website. But And then you're going to make sure then that it's that archived and... As best as possible, because once again, you know, you, we're, we're going to try to lock it down so that the trouble comes where, when people from outside of us can respond. Right. Because we have control over our, our employees, but if you, if you go to basically any Facebook page that has a public entity and you start to look through the comments, mm -hmm. you'll find everything control. to, yes, right. horrible I've heard language. that there's software you can put. I heard there's, when we went to the Osceola, I think it was the Osceola presentation, and they were talking about how they work with all of these things. And I think they mentioned that there's software you can use that will um, either flag or block people from making like yes. lewd comments on your. You your would page. still need to archive it though, okay. which is a weird twist of the you know the public records law in Florida. If it's if if there was a communication that occurred that is electronic, we must still archive it. But you can make it so. The but we would make it so the public it. wouldn't see it. And it's only going to get worse from here. So that's, that's why the focus on our, our side, or my recommendation to you, but once again, you guys can trump my, my recommendation, but I'm recommending that we try to make it front-facing as much as possible because the potential from the other direction is too great for problem. And, da, 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 and, and once again, the archiving piece um, <coughs> is going to have to reside at the level of the person who controls the page. Because the person who controls the page is the person who sets those settings and has the ability to see all of the posts and such like that. So each school that creates a page, and if a teacher allow, if a principal allows a teacher to have an individual page, each level would have to archive their comments. And once again, not that I'm saying that we should not do this, but there could be some difficulty when trying to sift through all of that content to find a specific message because there's not a good way for us to be able to do a search. Let me give you an example. When we get a public records request that comes from HR for a specific person's email or for a word or something, we have enterprise tools that we can say, look through every person's mailbox for this phrase, and then it gets archived into a package that we can then hand to somebody because at, as owners of the system, we can, we can look through the system for everything. Similar inside the Remind engine, we can look through the system. We do not have a good way to look through Twitter or through Facebook. And there have been times in the past with some social media sites that they may not be quick to respond or they may never respond if you reach out to them for help with something. Because you can imagine, they have billions of users. <laughs> you know, their less, least concern is us trying to ask them to look for something for us. So that's my recommendation in here, that we um, allow the systems, that we tell people that they must archive things that they put in there, but we highly recommend that it be as front-facing as possible. What do you mean? What does front facing mean? So, for instance, I, I can post stuff that you can see on Facebook, but you can't send stuff yeah. back to me. Okay. 
Does Facebook have that ability? I know Instagram you can. Yeah. Well, you know, the only problem is I could say yes today and tomorrow I could be wrong. Okay. You know, because they make changes all the time. They do put in quite a few things that allow you to set up a wall so that you can't post things. But I can't promise you that it'll always be like that. Well, and that was when we first started having the conversation. And the big concern was that you can't have two-way communication, and that's why we were all always yeah. saying we're not going to do Facebook. We're not mm -hmm. going to do it. But I, time marches on. This this will change. Yeah, I almost not forget the positive, which it is. It is a great tool. To it is a great tool, all the good especially things. when people want to move into the into this area. It gives them the ability to look in. Yeah. They will often look there before they look to a website. So if a school has a Facebook page where they post a link to their website, they they post maybe copies of their daily news. I know Deep Creek does a really good job with that type of thing with all the proper signatures and everything so that they can see what's happening in our schools. It's absolutely wonderful. You just have to do it mindfully. Right. We'll have next, a quiz on that later. <laughs> the next policy has to do with uh, mandatory reporting of misconduct. This is that statute to which I alluded earlier uh, 1012.795796 and the essence of this policy is to examine those employee behaviors that affect adversely the health safety and welfare of students there's always in these policies a tremendous amount of emphasis on anything that translates from adults to kids and has to do with sexuality <coughs> dating um, romantic or lewd behaviors, all of that is encapsulated in these policies and it is the one thing that we say in HR that is a disqualifier if people come in having any kind of history in this bailiwick, we immediately discount them as a, a bona fide uh, applicant for a job. So this goes through that, it does emphasize behind the curtain the heavy role that professional practices has as an office embedded in the Florida State Department of Education and it, it resonates throughout this entire policy. Uh, it does have the parental notification I alluded to earlier when someone has, a, a student has a teacher who is implicated in one of these behaviors, they have to be put on alert that their child may have been exposed to that behavior in the classroom. There are also as you may know, when somebody requests uh, a file on a teacher, there is a 10-day waiting period after a document such as a, a final summative investigative report is issued to a person. We have to alert them, the person that's, whose file is being requested, but also there's a 10-day 10, 10 delay in getting that report to become public. So it does have the sanctions that can be imposed by the district. We have to report all of that and it's always the superintendent who's mentioned in these matters, but typically we're charged in HR to upload to Steve so that he can remain safe and protected in the required language of this statute. Uh, all of the communication that we have in regards to an allegation being either sustained or denied in a person's behavior has to be uploaded also, even if we find that person innocent. In the process of doing the investigation, we still have to upload. Even if they never get a letter of reprimand, never does anything go to the state, we still have to upload that we had the allegation. And from the letter that Steve initially signs, putting a person out on paid administrative leave, pending an investigation, we have to upload that initial letter to put them on notice. So this is uh, extraordinary in the exacting behavior it expects of the district. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions in here. Just, go ahead. The parental notification, we need to change it. The legislature, as usual, didn't do their homework. Um, we need to add in the last line, misconduct shall receive written notification informing the parent or otherwise designated a legal guardian. Mm -hmm. uh, there you go. We have a great deal of, we have a number of children in our particular um, district that do not have a parent that is responsible for them with someone else. Secondly, and I don't know if we've reached out to the to the, um, to the uh, attorney for us yet, and I probably should have, I have a concern that we're being ordered to, to contact parents when we have students that are over 18. A student that's over the age of 18 has privacy rights that the children under 18 do not, and if we 
we could open ourselves up for liability if we contact a parent or a legal guardian mm -hmm. in that statute. capacity when they no longer are. I understand it's in the statute, yeah. but that doesn't uh, that doesn't relieve off us of other privacy protection requirements of an individual that's reached the age of 18 and is legally an adult. They can walk in and walk out of school tomorrow without notifying the parent. They can sign themselves out and say that I'm withdrawing. Um, they are an adult. That's been determined that they're an adult. I, I know it's opening up a can of worms, but I really think that we need to probably hang on until we get an answer from our legal counsel regarding that particular issue before we go forward and adopt a policy on that. Mike? I have worked with Ms. McKinley on this for a couple of different issues over the years. If the student's 18, but they're still considered as dependent on their parents' tax rolls, um, we're required to make sure we notify that parent. So that's, right. what, that's what we've been doing in the past. How do we make that determination before we call them and let them know? We would err on the side of caution. And then we end up with a lawsuit because we've told them and they're not they're not even living in the house. I'm just you know, it really I I, I understand that we're we're you know it, I dare on the side of the statute. Well I understand, but I, I do think that the right person gets a hold of it, it could be costly. You know, the student I should say this on a kind of a different note, not to interrupt you, Chuck, but the student um, you know, this happens on occasion throughout the year at the high school level, obviously, eighteen they want to um, put in writing that they don't want their parents to be notified, yada, yada, yada. They'll get that through the principal. The principal will call me. We look at each individual case on a case-by-case basis. And sometimes I'll go over and talk to the student myself. So we kind of slow it down, and then on occasion, we have granted the student those rights. Would, would you just do me the favor of reaching out to McKinley and make sure that he signs off on, on this language? I just, I would be more comfortable. All right. You know, in, in terms of the HR, I'll just say this very briefly. I worry in, in a similar regard that we would be alerting, let's say, some populations of kids who have already graduated from our system. And there could be um, a suit brought that said the district could and should have known at the time I was a student, and it didn't. And now I'm learning five years later the thing that I was exposed to has been going on for five, has been going on for five years now. So I think your point is well taken. Um, I had one question, the last, second to the last paragraph about posting requirements. Um, mm -hmm. The requirement that employees must notify if they know of misconduct. Mm -hmm. um, it says it should be posted in a prominent place at each school site and on each school's internet website. So I'm just double checking that that is the case. We well, it's funny that you say this. I just uh, set a meeting this morning to go over this language to see how we're going to, to go over this. So Chris will be invited to that. Uh, Dr. Keegan will be in there. Both the secretary to my role and also the Patrick's role will be in there, and I'm sure Chris will have others. But this is new, and uh, the idea of posting this in a prominent place in every school in the district will be. A bit daunting. We'll have to buy some signage, make sure the wording is standardized throughout. The web page will be the easiest either. part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's a very good point. I have a big thing here. Lynn and Patrick, when I read this, you know, we have to have a little meeting about how we're going to affect this policy. Any questions on that? We're moving on to information management. I'm glad you're still here, Chris. So, uh, <laughs> last one for me. This one's 8315. <laughs> And uh, this one uh, really gets into electronically stored information. Um, Daryl Milstead and Chris are basically in charge of this part of our district. So there's some big, big things in here that we need to be um, aware of. We can pull any type of um, communications that are done via email, via remind, things along those lines. But electronic stored information goes beyond that. It includes Word documents, PowerPoints, if somebody uses any other type of, of program to create something electronically. And it will require a fair amount of, of instruction to all of our employees so that they're aware of the requirements of this. Um, I bring you to the third paragraph underneath definitions because it's important. Um, the very beginning lists all sorts of different types of equipment, but on the on the fourth line towards the end, it says laptops and desktop, work computers, home and personal computers. 
So if you were to go home and create a document for use at work and you made it on your own time on your own computer, you would still be responsible for keeping an archive of it because it is still something that would need to be produced because it's an electronic stored information. Does that make sense? So the communication of that will be important when we share this out with the schools because teachers often will work at home on materials and things like that. Um, these laws, I have a lot of good reason to be here, but they become, once again, very, very difficult to manage in the real world because now not only are we trying to control the information that is on the devices that we own, but also on the devices that other people own. It's another good commercial for Remind, because remember I've mentioned to you in the past that if you're, sending, <laughs> if you're sending texts from your phone to other people, that's some of this stuff. So, they could, so your phone could be subpoenaed in an investigation, but if you did all your school-based communication through Remind, then we would be able to produce it through the Remind system. But it continues on towards the, to, towards the end of this paragraph, and this one will be especially important. Even if privately owned by the board member or employee from the date this policy is adopted into the future. So as soon as you adopt that, this policy, that will go into effect. That um, people will need to know that they are responsible for archiving anything that they've created on, on their computers at home or at work. And the reason why I say at work is there would not be a good mechanism for for us to know if you created a Word document. Let's say Steve created a, an agenda. There, there's, not, there's not a little light that goes off in my office that says, Steve created an agenda, go grab it and archive it. But what we could do and what we will do is we'll make a recommendation to people that in, in either OneDrive or Google Drive, um, one of the nice things is all of our employees have unlimited storage in both mechanisms. So they could create a folder called archived and just get in the habit of any time you create a document for the use of business in school, throw a copy, think of it as a black hole, just put it in there, just don't ever delete that folder, and um, then we will be able to meet the, the requirements of this. Can I just be picky? Uh huh. There's no such thing as a floppy drive that I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, they always do I don't that. know if there's even floppy disks anymore, Right. there's definitely not a floppy drive. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like what I was saying before, of not listing it on the website. Things move so quickly. I, it wouldn't be bad if we took that off. That um, was just boilerplate language from Neola. So usually, you know, at the bottom we'll say what laws this references. So all of this paragraph about doing things on your personal computer, is that in the public records law? Like the public records law says if you do something on your personal computer that's considered a I don't know. I, I will definitely look at that. I don't think so. Or is this Neola language? This is Neola says? language, but the public record law implies it in the sense that they might not say if you do this on your personal computer. It just says all documents must be archived. It doesn't say if you do it on your own computer or your computer business of school. You know, and, um, and with the public record, um, we just actually, working with HR, put in some software to try to manage these public records requests a, a little bit better. And you may already be experts at this, but the law is very, very vague in, in the sense that people don't even have to tell us who they are to submit a public records request. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Sounds like a full time business. Yeah. I'll start, I'll start something after <laughs> retirement, let's, let's. right? <laughs> Just not in this district. Yeah. <laughs> this is daunting. Like as a teacher, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it is. Like almost scary. Like I don't want to do anything at home. I don't want to do. You know. I mean, anything you create, it's mm -hmm. just. I think about all the things that I pulled in and used as a teacher, and it's like, how do you? That's just. Right. You know. We're in the information age, but the more information we get, the more restricted we may in reality be. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, because I agree with you. And in my opinion, it seems like there's so much overreach, but it is it's required. I know. Can't you just log into your own email, the the um, your school email, and use this? Use Word. That? That. Or, or if you log into Office 365 and you create the document in Office 365, mm -hmm. then it's automatically yeah. saved inside right. of our system. Yeah. You know, it's for the it. This is for people who choose to do well, like for the people who choose not to use Remind. Well, <laughs> then your phone has to be available upon request. If, if, 
We provide, we basically provide a tool in each aspect that would allow you not to have to sweat it, but you'd have to choose to use that tool. Thank you. Yes. Welcome to my moral. Yeah. <laughs> this last one in operations is a, a quite interesting one. It, it actually comes in two parts. The first one is, uh, is it reasonable for an employee, current or former, to ask for a recommendation from his or her supervisor or colleague? And the answer to that is yes. And the first part of this policy refers to all the nice things you can say. But it always says that it's the individual person who is requested to write the recommendation who is in control of deciding to write it or not. That is not a district issue, that is the person's issue. Then it goes into part two. And part two is prohibiting all of us who write recommendations from two things. One is falsifying any information and the other is withholding information when somebody's been in trouble. And so, of course, as I've said before, the big red flashing light for all of us in this business, anybody with a history of sexual abuse or being involved with children uh, while trying to also do something under a certificate in the state is verboten. And this law goes a bit further and says we should not and shall not write recommendations for those people, especially if we absent their behavior or their investigation or the result of those investigations. So we cannot do that and it pretty much says we shall not do that, nor shall our contractors do that. It does leave open some doors for where you can write and that is if the prosecution of the person has not resulted in adjudication or they've been acquitted or the case remains open with no conclusion. Uh, those are the final pieces here. So, I don't know how that feels to be here. Makes disappointed. We think we would even have to have a <coughs> that. I would hope that we wouldn't be ever writing a letter of recommendation just by nature. Apparently, people have. Yep. There's uh, something going on in one of our fellow counties. Well, it's just so. certainly uh, common sense should be a controlling factor. Yes, and in, in, yeah. That's the last policy. And I, I would say, in our HR practices, if someone has a record, uh, we generally limit our comment to the start date and end date for that person. If somebody calls in, we'll say, this person worked for us from here to here. Now, if we know something, we'll also say, you might want to check with professional practices on this person. So, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mike's coming up for this one. I think this one will be easier. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, I'm here for the annual review of school board policy 5120, uh, school assignment. It's the policy that we look at this time every year. I like to call it the burn straw triangle which is um, zoned for East Elementary School. I believe since 2007, we've allowed those students, grandfathered those students who live in that triangle to want to go to Sally Jones, to go to Sally Jones Elementary School. Um, and we're here to um, see what you school board wants to do with the triangle this year. Um, is the triangle like Burnt Storm Meadows? It's really Burnt yeah. Storm Meadows, it is, right? Yeah, it is okay. Burnt Storm. I drove the couple years ago because it it's, like it's, it's not a perfect isosceles no. but it's a triangle so I want to we're required every year to review our boundaries in general correct no what I guess my question is why are we having to review this every year because of the Sally Jones advance yes, yes. I'm actually working on and um, can we change that I'm working on that because every year we and just put that triangle in the Sally Jones exactly. district Oh, we, um, I, okay, we could do that. Um, so I wasn't planning on talking about this, except that last night I went to a meeting. The You might be aware that the city of Punta Gorda is um, doing a new master plan. The last time they did it was after the hurricane. And so um, they've invited the community to come in and work with Dover Cole, their firm, to talk about what we want the city of Punta Gorda to look like in the future. And if, 
the people sitting at this table will not be surprised to hear that there were hundreds of people in the room. I don't know how many. We had like round tables set up. There were something, there might have been like 50 different tables at the United Methodist Church with six people at each table. And then each table stood up what their big ideas for the city were after looking at the map. Out of all of those people, 500 people, only one person brought up schools. So all this planning about our city and going forward, and nobody talked about our schools. And so while we were sitting there, I was like, you know what, I want to look and see where we're at with capacity on our schools. And I noticed Charlotte High, at capacity, zero spots. Punta Gorda Middle, at capacity, zero spots. Sally Jones, from memory, I think it's 49. Sally Jones, who have 49 spots, and we still have spots right. open through controlled open enrollment right now. So the three schools that are within the city limits are just about at capacity. And nobody in the city of Punta Gorda is um, caring. Well, yeah, there, there were definitely people at that meeting that don't understand uh, why we can't just be a retirement community like the villages. Um, although I'll point out that even the villages have schools. Um, so I think it made me think it's, it's something to think about. I've always heard as a new school board member, more experienced school board members have told me that the hardest thing that comes up as a school board member is whenever you have to change boundaries. Right. Um, so, so Mike, is it, because yeah. it, it's under D where it says at the regular meeting in May of each year, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why that language can't be revised to say in the event that Sally Jones Elementary reaches blank percentage, the school board will have to make a decision at the main meeting. Uh, that's exactly what I'm working on right well, now, that exact verbiage that will give us flexibility because if we put that area in Sally Jones, then we're going to have East Elementary, we're going to be in the same spot. Right. I'm working with Jerry Lebo with the city of Punta Gorda with our uh, interlocal agreements to see if we have that flexibility, and I think we do. I actually have the language drafted that I was going to show you hopefully in May in order to change this to maybe a periodic review. So when I look at the boundaries and I look at the enrollment capacities, if there's an issue, I can bring it up to the school board and we can have that discussion. Um, right now, economically, money-wise, transportation-wise, we have two buses that serve that general area. And if we put all the kids in East Elementary, we would still need two buses to and serve that area. Be further it's, to it. it's not costing us any more money right now. And it's kind of in my world, in a way, a, a non-issue with enrollment, at least with Sally Jones. Well, and, and knowing the, the history of why this exists was when the, the, the explosion happened whenever this was, and the board was like, ooh, again, change boundaries upset people. So I know that the board at the time said, okay, we're going to... We're going to give you this triangle, but understand, we're going to have the ability every single year to potentially take that away. Um, You're saying we should put that triangle in permanently? No, no, no. I don't think we should put the triangle in permanently. I'm saying that, that it needs to be that it needs to be outlined that the triangle is still the triangle, but in the event that and you you tell me whatever whatever the magic number is that would that would potentially mean that when some if we had this meeting every year. At some point, in theory, the person in your position is going to come to the person, people in our position, and say, "Hey, guess what? We can no longer let any new people <coughs> try and go into this school." Yeah, I would actually like to keep it if we had to choose, uh, if we had to choose in East Elementary because of their capacity. They have uh, over a hundred more seats open right now. I really so don't. You would rather wait, say that again. You'd rather have that triangle be part of East. It, yeah, well, it, it, is, it, it is part. I mean, of it, it is, is part, part of East. East but if we had to come to a decision, if we had to, to with those Sat Sally Jones parents or Sally Jones that capacity, um, we have the room at East Elementary. Right. I think to put it all into Sally Jones would maybe push We're pretty close right now, Sally, right? With well, only 49 well, spots. 49 left. spots. I think I have 10 more spots open. Uh, we're not, so we're not going to even hit a lottery, and that's even allowing the 26, 26 students in the triangle go to Sally Jones, 15 go to East Elementary right now. So it's uh, it's kind of close, 50-50. Well, it takes us 30 minutes to reevaluate it every year. I personally don't have a problem with addressing it on an annual basis, bringing it to us. That way we're updated on the information or without, you know, and, and we annually can look at it and make an intelligent decision each year. I mean, it, it, I understand it's been back and it'll be back if it continues, but 
uh, I think it would be fresh on our mind if we got that information on an annual basis from you as to what's going on out there and, and weren't and, and, and don't have you chasing a change now and spending time right. for a change that very well might usurp itself by growth in the very foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was concerned after I started looking at those numbers last night and looking at um, the city and what's going on. I don't know what the census says as far as what growth is going to be in school-age children over the next 10 years. Mr. Greiner does. Although the state, the states... <laughs> Well, what we have to use for the state, I've always been told, is really not that accurate. It kind of lags behind. Especially west of the Miami. Um, <coughs> <It's lagging. laughs> I, I will accept your denouncement of my idea. Okay. You know, um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future with Charlotte High and Punta Gorda Middle and Sally Jones. Um, eventually, there is going to come the point where we're not going to have any more spots in those schools. And eventually what's going to happen, hopefully long after I'm gone, um, put it on some other poor person, that the decision is going to have to be made to either A, build a new school, and we only have one piece of property there in Punta Gorda, the one out in Tropical Gulf Acres, right? Uh, Notre Dame. Street. Uh, what about the one in Notre Dame? That's it's kind of back out that, that way. Um, <laughs> or to change the boundaries for those schools. And I can't even imagine what the uproar will be if the boundary gets changed to the river. Yeah. Well, again, that's a bridge we'll cross when we have Hopefully to Hopefully when we're gone, no. and it'll be somebody oh, that's else. That's a bridge too far. So, <laughs> I, I, so we leave it how it is. Does anybody feel like we need to change the boundary for this year? No. Right. I think it's fine this year, and, and we'll look at it again next year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dr. D. Mr. Dr. D? Dr. Mr. D. The only uh, update I have on the Oversight Committee is we have one member uh, who we're still going to train, I'll say, in their new role. Uh, that's the 25th, I believe, is the last one. Uh, and then we'll be ready to present um, in, I think it's April 3rd. That's the only update I have on do, do we need to keep that as a recurring item on the workshop, or should we just have it so that Whenever it is time for the oversight committee to represent to us, it becomes present to us. It becomes a item. I mean, I, I would say so. I, I don't think you need it. I think when they're appointed now, they're, they're in appointed. place. Yeah, I think that was there to make sure we got it up and running. It's right. up and running. Yeah, I, we'll meet quarterly, like the board, uh, like the, uh, the committee said they would. So I, I, think, and, I think. And it certainly, if we wanted an update from you on some, if anything was going on, we would say, "Hey, give me an update That's on the oversight right. committee." So I, I just think we take it off the do we have a schedule of when they're going to be meeting uh, April quarter? 3rd is the next meeting and uh, I think they even went one farther than that uh, but that could be dictated at the April 3rd meeting they'll decide their schedule of that. that's when we're supposed to be leaving for yes we'll be in Tallahassee when they have their meeting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, okay which is good probably maybe all right do we need to attend the, the workshop nope Baker it was a fun meeting last month. I love the babies. Oh, I know they are. And Master Board? June 3rd. Consensus came to June 3rd. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And they're going to come to us. I think we're, yes, we're coming here, but I think we're having a conversation. Kind of going out of Jerry's world. Well, because, so we're, so not, we're not. Out of Terry and Jerry's world. No, it's going to be okay. in Charlotte County. Okay. I think it's going to be at Jerry's uh, complex. Okay. Okay. Hmm. okay. All right, meeting adjourned. Good job.